A film that I love is Inside Out. It's a Pixar film and it follows a, a family as they move to the other side of the United States and the daughter goes through loss and grief. Throughout the film, the emotions that we have inside of us are personified. They're given little cartoon characters and, and the film is all about these emotions interacting with each other. There's a, a goofy moment where the mum and the dad are arguing and the emotions within mum, they get out an old film and they play this memory of a, of a dark and mysterious stranger reaching out his hand and saying, come with me. The implication being, we could have chosen him and here we are married to this guy in front of us. I don't know if you have an alternative timeline. Maybe you have relationships that you wish had gone differently or a job that you wish you'd taken or a place you wish you'd moved to or a conversation that you replay in your head. If I was telling the story of Lazarus dying and being raised to life by Jesus, no doubt the main scene would be the raising to life. And I'd want to know the details. What happened to Lazarus whilst he was in the grave? How did it feel for him? What was the response of friends and family to this miracle? How did Lazarus live his life after this incredible encounter? There are loads of timelines throughout the Gospel of John where people's lives are changed by those short conversations and encounters. But the story of Lazarus doesn't major on that. In fact, all those questions I raised don't get answered. The actual bringing to life of Lazarus is the smallest part of this part of the Gospel of John. And by far the biggest part is what we look at today, where Mary and Martha, two, Laz two of Lazarus' sisters, just deeply, profoundly in grief, confront Jesus. And they call out to him desperately. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. Martha knows who Jesus is. She confesses it. You are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is to come. Why did Jesus allow this to happen? Jesus has three responses. The first response is that he is deeply troubled. A lot of commentators on John say that that verse um, contains a word often used of, of horses when they, when they snort, this idea that actually Jesus was a little bit indignant or impatient or upset. And some older English translations of the Bible keep that in there, that Jesus is somehow angry or disturbed by this, disturbed by the situation of what has happened, disturbed by the questioning of, of his timing. But then comes the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. That's a whole sermon series in and of itself. What does it mean to have a God who weeps? A God who is eternal and yet is so saddened by death and loss. And then he responds with a profound teaching. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says, I am on a different timeline. I see things from a different perspective. That he is the one who is the word with God at the beginning. And he is the one seated at the right hand of the father at the end. And all in between. He has a different perspective on these things. So in the midst of our season of loss, where we say, Jesus, if you were here, we would not be going through what we're going through right now. 
Jesus, if you heard our prayers, this virus would have stopped. Our church would be together again. Our families would be united. We wouldn't have lost so many people. How can we feel the emotions of Jesus? How can we feel his compassion, his tenderness? We feel it just through coming to him real and broken, like Mary and Martha. Not scared of the questions we might ask or trying to get our theology right in our prayers. Calling out to him and who he is. You're Messiah, you're God's son, you're the one who is to come. But surely this wouldn't have happened if you'd been here. It's okay to have those prayers with God. And actually in that, we do experience the compassion of Jesus. The other question is, how do we live this year in the light of his resurrection? How do we live this year with that eternal perspective? This is a bad season to make big decisions. This is a difficult season and it's hard to do much more than just put one foot in front of the other. But it is a season and it will pass. And this season won't define us. So I think there's a real urge for us not to make decisions that will define us the other side out of this, unless they are where God is calling us, unless they come with that heavenly perspective of what God is calling us to be and to do. Those two questions are intention, really, aren't they? The compassion of God for today. But the courage for tomorrow to keep on going and to keep making decisions in light of eternity, not in light of just getting through this current season and where we are now. I pray that you may find a balance between the two of those today. May you know the compassion of God and may he fill you with courage for all that is to come.